Justin and Peter, welcome to the podcast. It is really a thrill to have you here to talk to us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yes, great to be here. I'd like to have you take a moment and introduce yourselves and how people might know you outside of Antango Makes 3, perhaps. Sure. I'm Justin Richardson, and uh, I am a psychiatrist. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at Columbia University and a psychoanalyst in practice. And I live in New York here with my husband, Peter, and our daughter and our dog. And I'm Peter Parnell. I'm uh, a writer. I write plays and I write for TV. And Justin is my husband and have been together for a long time. Our daughter is 13. So, Oh, congratulations. That's awesome to hear about such long-term relationships. I want to talk a little bit about, as we get into our primary topic, because we definitely want to talk about all the book bannings and some of the anti-LGBTQ things that are going on and what we can do about those. But what's kind of brought you into this was a book that you wrote almost two decades ago now with Antango Makes Three. Tell everybody a little bit about what this absolutely delightful children's book is about. Sure. Well, let's see. It's a true story. It's something that was written about uh, in the New York Times, which we read about in a piece that was dealing with homosexuality in the animal kingdom. And it was an example, the major example in this article in the Times was about this um, this pair of um, penguins in the Central Park Zoo who pair bonded and tried to hatch a rock. Their names were Roy and Silo. And the zookeeper at the Central Park Zoo noticed this and knew of another penguin pair who could only hatch one egg. And he gave an egg that wasn't yet hatched to Roy and Silo. And they did all of the things that you need to do before the egg hatches. And the egg did hatch. The zoo named her Tango. And they were, in a sense, a family, which we read about. And Justin primarily got very excited because he saw the possibilities of it as a story that could be for different kinds of families. How did you go from that initial, like, this could be great story for families to actually deciding to collaborate on this project. Justin always says yes, or or comes in very excited with and says, we can do this. And I usually, I go, well, I'm not so sure. But so it was a Saturday. We were in the process of trying to start our family. So our daughter wasn't yet born, but we were working on that. So it was very much on our minds, the nesting process was very much on our mind. So the article in the Times landed at a very fertile moment. And I saw it in the Saturday paper. We were at the breakfast table. I said, oh, Peter, you have to hear this story. And I read the story to him aloud. And there was something about reading it aloud. It just sounded like a children's book. It sounded like a picture book. And I put down the paper. And I think I kind of said, we have to write this today. (laughs) And Peter said what he usually says is, oh, and I said, I'm starting. And, you know, we had a draft by the end of that weekend. And I had published a book just a couple of years earlier. It's a parenting book that I co-wrote with a pediatrician named Mark Schuster, who's the dean of the Kaiser Permanente Medical School called Everything You Never Wanted Your Kids to Know About Sex, But Were Afraid They'd Ask. So I had a very clear sense of, you know, the situation that parents find themselves in, because I was speaking at schools around the country to parents. And, you know, we obviously knew two dad and two mom families who were going through the process of having little kids. And we were sensitive to the need of those families to have some picture books that represented their families. But also because I was traveling around the country and speaking at schools about how to talk about sex to groups of parents, I understood the anxiety that a lot of parents have about talking about sex in a way that is age appropriate. You know, how can I say this without in some way damaging my child or inspiring my child to have sex or uh, saying something that's inappropriate? And one of the things that had come up in these talks was what's a book that you know, we can share with our kids to tell them about the two mom or the two dad families that they're going to encounter in school. And at the time, you know, this was like the late 90s that I was doing these talks. There really wasn't all that much. 
So seeing the article, seeing that it had, this story had the structure of a classic children's book, cute characters who really want something that they probably can't get. And they try and they fail. And then some nice person intervenes and helps them realize their dream. I mean, it just seems so perfect. And it also seemed really clear, okay, if we give this book to families that feel like they want to talk about the two dad family down the street, but don't know how, this will give them the courage to do that and know that they're doing it in an age appropriate way. They're talking about penguins hatching an egg. So that's really what, you know, kind of lit the fire under getting this thing done and getting it out. Uh, so by the end of that first weekend, we had a draft, which was, you know, a first draft for sure, mm -hmm. and sent it to my book agent who had little kids who had been to the Central Park Zoo, who gave us some notes. And we revised it and learned about, you know, from scratch, how you structure a children's picture book. They're 32 pages. We didn't know that. How do you sequence the text across those 32 pages, thinking about pacing, timing, and so on? And we worked on it a good bit. And then it went out as a submission to a number of publishers. How long did it take for it to get picked up? Because, I mean, we're talking, as you said, like late 90s, early 2000s. The book actually came out in 2005. So yeah, well, you know, you're, we were, you're 10 years before marriage equality yeah, and all that. <laughs> that's right. First of all, we felt that it was something that we wanted to try to get published as quickly as possible, as did Justin's agent. But also there was a gentleman who has sadly passed now, but who was a wonderful editor, a book editor named David Gale at Simon & Schuster. And David really trailblazed both picture books like the, the Sissy Duckling, Harvey Fierstein's book, and a lot of YA fiction that would be appropriate for teenagers dealing with LGBTQ issues. And David was really, it really was one of the pioneers in doing that. And he read our manuscript and got very excited about it and also knew or very much that it was something he could try to, in a sense, put on the fast track. And so being, you know, first time picture book authors, but not being an illustrator. And, and usually classically, I think in publishing picture books, the, the illustrator isn't the same person as the writer. They very often don't communicate. And in this case, we very much wanted to help select who could illustrate the book and to be able to work with the illustrator. And it was to David's strength and Simon and Schuster's great strength that they said yes. And then we met Henry Cole, and that began our collaboration with him in terms of the pictures in the book. And the pictures are just gorgeous. I mean, the, the way that they look almost, to me, it's something between watercolors and chalk drawn. I don't know. I just think it's just wonderfully and soft. Like you can just, you know, feel the softness of those penguins. Well, that's exactly, you know, what we said. We said we wanted something that was soft and that would have some realism, but also would be really appealing to young kids. And, you know, we were trying to decide actually between two publishers because there was, you know, it was a moment that major publishers had suddenly just become ready to publish a book like this. The previous books for little children had come out of much, much smaller presses. So there was actually a lot of interest from a lot of presses and there was an auction and we were trying to decide between two presses. And that was when we started to talk to each press about illustrator options and who, if we went with this press, who would they offer us? And Henry had read the book, David Gale sent it to him and he wrote us a letter and he sent us two drawings, one of Tango and one of Roy and Silo. And they were so perfect that just decided it, you know, okay, we're going with, Simon Schuster, and it's got to be Henry Cole. And the rest of that collaboration was just kind of a dream. And people who write picture books and don't illustrate them don't often have the kind of experience we had with Henry Cole, which was he was so collaborative and such a pleasure to work with. You know, we went to the zoo together and we looked at sketches and gave each other notes and worked on the pacing. And 
the art director was a great facilitator of this collaboration. His name is Dan Potash. And it was just a joy, the collaboration, really from beginning to end. That's amazing. And I love hearing just wonderful collaboration stories like that. Now, this book you know, has an unfortunate designation in the midst of all this as being one of the most banned books over the years, going all the way back to when it first came out. And it actually leads to a question <laughs> that Gigi, who's a member of our Patreon community, has for you. When you started writing this cute children's book about penguins, did you imagine that it could be so controversial and even controversial for years on? Yeah, well, you know, because as Justin just was saying, you know, there was a, the beginning of an appetite for a, a book like this, but there weren't books out there like this. And so we knew that while it was a true story and while it was a story about penguins and, and we could use it as a way to talking about different kinds of families, I think we thought at some point there might be a reaction. And in fact, the pre-publication reviews and the sense of celebration around the book was really strong and as it's continued, but for the first year, year and a half, there wasn't that much. And it really took parents, you know, where a child would bring the book home from the school library or from the public library, parents who began to react and feel that the book was inappropriate for their kids. That started this. And once it's, that began, which was funny, it sort of happened at the year that March of the Penguins came out, that movie. And so penguins were on everybody's mind, but in a different way. And penguins were being used in a sense, from different political points of view. And as a result, the book then took on a different kind of life in a way. What have you seen change over the years on the types of challenges that the book has faced? Well, you know, there's been a recent change, really, I would say within just the last year. And I'll say the previous challenges were challenges, as Peter said, they were for the most part brought by a parent whose child had taken the book home and the parent was surprised and felt that the book was inappropriate for their family because they had anti-homosexual attitudes in their family and they did not want a book that was accepting of gay families read by their child. That was the sort of engine of pretty much every challenge, at least in the United States that we saw. Quite often, the book was seen by these families as in conflict with their religious beliefs. I mean, and that happened in Europe as well. Most recently, we're seeing something very different, and it's in tune with the movement in the Republican Party, which would be in the so-called parents' rights movement, which is to say that what we're seeing is politicians who are making complaints about this book and books like it as a way in a sort of cynical gesture to stoke parents' anxiety and to propel their own political career. So that's very much what you see with Ron DeSantis and the state legislature in the state of Florida. I really doubt that any of them has read our book. And if they did, if they could possibly make an argument that there's something about it that's harmful for children, but that's not the point, right? The point is to get media attention, press attention for doing something that kind of stirs up their base. And so in a way, it's much more frightening. I mean, at the past years, the way a, a challenge would play out, say it was in Loudoun County, Virginia, or it was in Chico, California, there would be a complaint about the book to a school, librarian, school librarian would pass it on to the principal, would pass it on to the superintendent, the school board would meet and they would say, oh, we need to figure out a process whereby we review books that are challenged and we have to decide whether we're going to take this out of the library or keep it in the library. And at a certain point in that process, an attorney for the school district would tap somebody on the shoulder and say, you know, actually, it's against the United States Constitution for you to take this out of the library. It's a violation of freedom of speech. So, you know, there are great Supreme Court precedences that have established that you can't censor a book because you don't like the content of it. So a school library that's a public school 
if the book is in the library, the book stays in the library. And so we would, you know, kind of wait for this process to go, you know, wind its way to its conclusion and feel like it's going to be okay. I think now when it is a state legislature that's pushing it, or as in the case of Texas, a gentleman was actually running for attorney general in the state of Texas, who is rattling the cages of school librarians. It's much more frightening and dangerous. And, you know, truthfully, the law passed in Florida and was signed into law by the governor. So our book really cannot be read in any public school in Florida unless the school is willing to risk being sued. You wrote a really interesting opinion piece for the Washington Post back in April, and you were addressing specifically Florida's Don't Say Gay bill. But you also take on book bannings a little bit too, because as you noted, the book bannings now are on a much broader level than just a single parent, you know, raising an objection to a singular school or library or whatever. And I really loved how you looked at other children's books that should be reexamined within the Florida law. Can you share a couple yeah. of, ex of selections from that piece to kind of give a flavor of what you did in that article? Well, first of all, it, in the history of what we've just told you about, we got very involved with the folks at the American Library Association who were dealing with book bannings year in and year out. And when and Tango Makes Three became sort of the, the lightning rod for this, we would read at readouts against censorship and removal of, of books, as Justin said, which are unconstitutional to remove from, from the library once the libraries bought it. So we were familiar with that aspect of book banning. Do you want to explain? Yeah, well, I, you know, the, um, the piece, it's a satirical piece that we're really delighted to publish in the Washington Post. And one of the great pleasures of it, actually, just to go back to Henry Cole, was that the Post said, why don't we see if your illustrator will draw the penguins again? And so Roy and Silo and Tango got redrawn for the first time in however many years to illustrate this piece in the Post. But the piece was a satire about this really wretched law in Florida. And one of the things that we noticed immediately when reading the text of the law is that the law bans any discussion, discussion is in the introduction, or instruction, which is in the later part of the law, about sexual orientation or gender identity. And I thought this is a law that could only be written by heterosexual people who have not realized that heterosexuality is a sexual orientation and that being boyish as a boy or girlish as a girl is a gender identity. And so we wanted to play with that idea because, in fact, the way the law is written, any discussion that would lead to a discussion about sexual orientation, such as heterosexuality, or gender identity, such as being a boy or being a girl, is forbidden. So we then took a look at books like Ferdinand. And make way for ducklings. Make way for duck. Wonderful books, classics that we love, in we, fact, we, and that influenced us even growing up as kids. I mean, Ferdinand was probably Justin's favorite picture book. We went to all the great classics and we said, okay, let's look at Make Way for Ducklings. Well, it starts out with there's really no way around the sexual orientation of this duck pair. One's a male and one's a female. They're obviously heterosexual. So that's sort of off the table. And look, they reproduce in it. So you're going to get all sorts of forbidden questions like, why does a female duck marry a male duck? What does it mean that they had children? So all the way down to the very hungry caterpillar, which we at that, that point in the piece, we're getting um, even a little bit sillier. And we're talking about the fact that the caterpillar transforms into a quote, beautiful butterfly. And we thought, you know, some people might see that as a bit of a metaphor for being trans. So best to avoid that one as well. But the point of the article was really quite dead serious, which is the framers of this law have not recognized that they have sexual orientations too, and that they have gender identity too. And they've just outlawed speaking about any of that from grades K through three in all of their schools of the state. How ridiculous is that? 
Or I, another way of looking at it, and I don't know, is that it is written in such a general way, the law, in order to, for them not to be accused of what has become don't say gay, which is to be um, intolerant of gay of LGBTQ people and uh, parents, two, two mom, two dad, single mom, single dad families, that in order not to be accused of that, in fact, the law, which is rather badly written, therefore, is ambiguous in ways that allowed us to take this satiric point of view on it. Satire does such a great job of pointing out some amazing truths. Yeah, it was very fun, you know, to do. And to get back in touch with Henry and to have him illustrated. And then the Washington Post had us tape a recording of us reading the piece, which was also really a delight and it's fun to listen to. Oh, that's awesome. I'll, we'll definitely link to that and the article as well so that people can see all of this. I have to say my favorite bit because you picked up one of my favorite children's books as well. Like I loved Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel when I was a kid. <laughs> and the fact that you raised the question of, you know, how can you tell if the engine's a boy or a girl? Can boys be backhoes? That's right. That's you right. Know, and they're all single. Are they asexual? Who can say? But maybe you should steer clear of that book too. Um, how was the reaction to the piece after it ran? We got so many responses from friends who said, I laughed so hard and it is so sad, you know, because as you said, it's both things. We're trying to be funny to point out something that's really a, a kind of tragic development, especially in the lives of kids in Florida. And, and what feels like, as Justin was saying before, an, a further step in this, in that when we've been asked in the past, what was our reaction to being censored or attempts at banning? On one level, there's a certain amount of attention that comes to the book, but of course, it's in pursuit of something that we're completely opposed to, and that is against the Constitution, and that we have to fight to maintain and preserve the integrity of. So I do think it, it, it is a, a further step in this battle. And it just seems to keep growing too. I feel like we're talking specifically on May 12th. And I feel like every week, every few weeks, we're hearing about more book bannings, more anti-LGBTQ bills that are popping up. And it seems like a really difficult time that we really have it faced in mostly since marriage equality, but certainly things got crunchy with our last president as well. What advice you might have for how parents can help support their queer children with what's going on and how allies can support too, because there's just so much negativity. And I think those of us who are older kind of know how to deflect that to a certain degree. But I feel so bad for the young people today who are just having to hear all these various messages, even if they don't live in the affected states. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. We found time and again, even way back when the book was first having these, these controversies that when local newspapers, when local LGBTQ plus groups, when members of school boards who were against censorship, when people banded together, got together, did readouts, or, you know, let it be known, have the publicity known of what was going on, it was very, very helpful to the community. I mean, Justin mentioned Loudoun County, the local gay group there dressed up as penguins and went to the demonstration in favor of the book and read the book aloud. I mean, you, you know, this was a community that was coming together in a sense to make sure that people understood what was going on. And I think local on that level, which is in a sense what Florida is, and then it ripples out to the rest of the country or Texas. Yeah, I think we'd really recommend finding other families. It's so important. And it's important psychologically and it's important politically, you know, psychologically to simply be able to connect for kids with other kids their age who are queer identified for parents who are queer identified to have other parents, for parents who are heterosexual, who have kids who are identifying as queer to meet other parents like that. These relationships can be so sustaining and so protective, even in a school where there's a lot of negativity coming at a kid. If they have their group, that's all the world to them. But also, you know, as Peter was saying, politically organizing can be very, very persuasive. I think probably the most persuasive form of demonstration we saw in the last 15 years took place in Singapore. 
and I'm going to say this is around 2014, uh, the government of Singapore decided to pulp every copy of our book that was in any library in Singapore. They announced this, and it seemed like the announcement was spurred on by there having been the very first gay pride parade in Singapore, and the government took this action. And of course, there were a lot of people who were very unhappy about this, and a group, a rather large group of parents got together, and they staged a read-in. They took their children in their pajamas to the steps of the National Library in Singapore. And there must have, I don't know if there were maybe 50 um, children and parents there. They brought a videographer, so there were cameras, and they read our book and other books like our book to their children on the steps of the library. And this video got quite a lot of play on the local news, the national news and international news. And I think it was one of the things that actually forced the government to change their minds. And they decided not to pulp Antenna Mix 3, which was a great outcome. And it was, I think, largely because of this kind of public protest, uh, which just starts with families finding one another. What have you seen coming from Florida and Texas? I mean, we keep mentioning those states because they've certainly been some of the more high profile ones, but about how people are rallying in those states and, and starting to push back. We loved their, there's a high school in Florida, and I can't remember the name of the school district now, where they had a say gay walkout, and there were hundreds of kids and their supportive teachers who just walked out of the school onto the sports field in the middle of a school day. That's the kind of action that gets a lot of attention and gets on the news. And you know, you hope has an effect at minimally, it has an effect on the queer kids in that state to see how many kids there are, at least in one school, who have their backs. This happened before Ron DeSantis signed it, it certainly didn't stop him signing it into law. But I'm sure that it was very helpful to a lot of kids and families. What can you recommend for people on how to help, especially if they're in states where these aren't happening? What's some good maybe national and, and local resources, if you can kind of point us in the right direction on where people can help if they're not in these states and then even how to defend to make sure they're not going to end up in a state like that? Sure. Well, there are some great national organizations that combat censorship. One of them we've mentioned, the American Library Association, Office of Intellectual Freedom is a great organization. And they have folks there who are tracking challenges and helping bring attention to the risk of suppression of ideas all the time. So that's an organization you might want to support. You can go to their website and check out the information that they have there. PEN America is yeah, another organization. The, yes. Pen, well, PEN America, which is a great organization, has a children's book division, basically, in which you can not just lodge complaint, but you can file a report with them. They are more than supportive in the same way that the ALA uh, American Library Association, and the ACLU, as a matter of fact. Excellent. We'll definitely link to those organizations for our listeners so they can get more information and hopefully support those organizations to help push back against these. And I think it can't be understated as well that get out and vote. Definitely try to put people in office who aren't going to support banning books and aren't going to be looking to set up more anti-LGBTQ bills. That's and, right. And we'd also mention the National Coalition Against Censorship, which is another great organization. It's very much on top of this issue. Another great one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I hope many of our listeners will will go and take some action there. Now, this interview is going to be airing in Pride Month. And I would love to know what Pride means to each of you in 2022. Gosh, I would say that when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15, there was a TV show that David Susskind hosted called Open End. And one of the first, I, I was a kid, I was a, in 
in, in bed on a whatever it was Sunday night. My parents were watching the show, and it was the first panel. Arthur Bell, I remember, was on it from the Village Voice about homosexuality from talking about the lives of, in this case, it was gay men. And I actually think it's the moment I remember of it as if it was sort of struck, you know, I was hit over the head. I suddenly realized that I was at an age where I was beginning to think about other boys and I realized what or who I was. I felt both the same and different. And I remember the next day walking around, mailing a letter, whatever, thinking I am me. And yet something I'm naming something that I wasn't aware of. I would say that first, for me, that first day, that awakening for me to think of the fact that just two or three years ago, our daughter marched in the gay pride parade and you know, ran up and down, shaking the hands or slapping the backs of supporters while we marched with her. There is, you know, in a sense, a lifetime and a whole journey that which way too I can't go into here, but that really does have to do with the movement, with being proud and with owning who I was and, and who I am and what it means to me to be, in my case, to be married, to have a daughter, to have a family. One of the great things for us is that June is Pride Month and it's also the month of Father's Day. So it, it's a time that we celebrate joy of being dads together and it all comes together when we march down Fifth Avenue with our daughter. But I think it's just a helpful reminder that, you know, I, we've been together for like 25 years and you can get to a certain point of thinking, oh, gay shmay, it's like, you know, isn't that so like yesterday, is this really still an issue? But we've come so far, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, now that our daughter is 13, we, we're in touch with 12 year olds and 13 year olds who are just coming to terms with their sexual orientation. And guess what? It's still hard. <laughs> it's still hard for them. And, you know, all of us, we live with a certain degree of homophobia, like a bit of shrapnel from a war that's in us that we have to find a way to live with and live around. But for these kids, it's not all been solved. It's still quite hard. Even in a place like Manhattan, there's still the challenge. A 12 year old recently said to our daughter, life in the closet is hard. And we thought, you know, two things. One, that is so adorable. At 12, you're able to say that. And you were, you were spared 10 years in the closet. So that's great. On the other hand, he's right. Even when you're 12, maybe especially when you're 12, it's hard. It's not easy. And those kids need us to make these events for them. Yeah, absolutely. I just, it strikes me as hearing that from a 12 year old, it's like, I wish that we could have, you know, when we were coming up and as young adults could have pushed the world further to make it better for that 12 year old where they didn't have to have that pressure, but yeah, I mean, it's still there. Yeah. And that's the task for us now with this Florida law and all the ones that are going to follow it's on us to help those kids. I'm curious if there's any projects that you're working on that we should be looking out for in the future as we kind of wrap up here. Well, you know, we came together to write this picture book and a subsequent one called Christian the Hugging Lion, which is another kind of gay family story, in this case involving a true story about a lion. But since then, we've really gone back into our corners and I'm being a psychiatrist and Peter's being a playwright. And he's got some plays that are being worked on right now. And that will be the next art that comes out of our household. I love how you phrase it that way. The next art that comes out of your household. But, <laughs> and I love that you kind of came together to do the, these couple of books and then you were kind of done with that piece of creation and then moved down to, you know, some other things too. It was, yes. And it was a great pleasure and privilege to be able to do that because we both love picture books and we grew up loving them, even if we didn't realize that they were only 32 pages long, <laughs> uh, but we love them. And we met so many fantastic people and librarians who are at the, in the forefront of this and obviously and parents and families and kids. So it was an amazing experience for us. Yeah. 
And we really can't underestimate librarians. I don't think we've sung their praises enough because they're on the front lines <laughs> trying to get these books Absolutely. to the right people while also facing any vitriol that may come from people who don't want kids to have books like these. That's right. right. And they're in a really precarious situation. They need to protect their jobs. <laughs> and every time they get a list of books that they can consider whether to buy or not, they have to think, this is a great book but will it jeopardize my job if I buy it? And that's a terrible situation for them to be in. And that is exactly the kind of dilemma that folks like this lawmaker in Texas is trying to create in their minds. It's a way of creating censorship without ever having to write a law. It's simply through intimidation. So they are the front line, and they're under enormous pressure, especially in some states. Yeah, so anything you could do to maybe tip your hat to your local library in the next time you're in, definitely do that. Let them know that yeah. they're appreciated. Absolutely. Well, Peter and Justin, it has been such a delight talking to you. I wish we'd met under slightly better circumstances than talking about book bannings and such, but I've loved hearing your story, and I hope our listeners have some action steps they can take to help fight against this problem. We hope so too. And thank you so much for having us. It's a delight to talk with you. 